our philosophy of scratch made food and and beverage will extend to other brands that we launch um you know i kind of foresee us being a scratch made company not just with this particular bakery cafe um we've been talking about doing a uh, fast casual mexican concept from scratch as well you you know walk in you see your uh tortillas being made by hand and and chips being fried and you know maybe pastor on a spit uh you know we grew up in the central valley um although i'm not of hispanic descent but i grew up with a lot of uh uh friends of mine who are mexican and we grew up eating taco trucks <laughs> you know so um we want to take a simple taco truck menu and put in a brick and mortar uh, but serve real food down to even salsas and whatnot being made from scratch. Welcome back to Winning at Work. It's season three, the podcast for the food and beverage and CPG world. I'm Jennifer Lee, Tony's new marketing sidekick and creative guru. I'll attempt to keep him on track as we discover the ideas and strategies behind all these different better and special brands. Oh, good luck keeping me on track, but I am really stoked to have you on the team, Jennifer. Your background in marketing and SEO and socials, we are going to have so much fun this year. We're going to be discovering the new brands here in 2023. It's all about functional, good for you, lifestyle brands. Those are trending. Those are the products that are gaining market share and really pulling away from those old legacy brands. We're going to have each and every one of those brands down on the podcast to talk to us, to share their ideas, their inspiration. So you, the entrepreneur, so you, the food and beverage and CPG professional can take these new ideas in and incorporate them into your business and into your life. Oh my gosh, Tony, I'm seriously so excited. I feel like I learn so much just from listening to older episodes. Well, that's why we're here. And if this is your first time here, I would recommend, look, go back, take the five episode challenge, pick a brand, pick a CEO, an entrepreneur, dive in, listen to what it is that they're teaching us. If you love the content, subscribe. We hope you're along with us for the journey each and every week. Hey, it's Jennifer. We get it. Everyone hates hiring. Inspired by his guests, Tony created a novel talent acquisition program that attracts the hidden candidate market, the 70% of people that are not actively applying to jobs. Click on the attract link in the show notes to watch a demo. Yeah, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Ronnie Gavargis, uh, CEO at Scratch Bakery Cafe. Welcome in, Ronnie. Thanks for having me. You know, I think what really kind of struck me just about your about your business, and I do want to get into your business model, is just this concept of scratch bakery, right? It's much more difficult, much more time consuming. There's obviously other challenges that are involved. And yet you're building a business around literally scratch and your business is called Scratch Bakery Cafe. Tell us a little bit more about your your restaurant concept. Well, it's it's a it's just just what it says in the in the name it's it's a from scratch concept so we literally i'd say you know manufacture uh, north of 90 percent of everything we serve we make in-house and although it's difficult um i think the consumer really can tell the difference um you know we make our pastries daily literally from the base to to finish um so it it Although it's difficult, it's difficult business to scale. Um, you know, we, we, we to a fault, we don't uh, deviate from that process. Right. And that's the challenge because that's why I wanted you down here because you are in the process of growing. You are in the process of scaling. So what actually motivated you to expand your restaurant business? One of the parts we, we actually enjoy is, is creating jobs, believe it or not. Um, you know, we're, a little over 40 employees now. Um, and we started with one location. We've got a second location that we, uh, believe it or not, opened up during the pandemic. Um, and, and, and we got location three and four in the works right now. Um, just, you know, I personally have an entrepreneurial background and, and, and spirit. So I enjoy building. Um, you know, it's nice. You, people eat your food and you see the look on their face and they come back and, you know, we've already in a 
short eight years since the inception, um, you know, we've gotten to see some babies coming in their uh, strollers and, and now coming back as, you know, six, seven, eight year old kids that are still coming back wanting the same. That's amazing. Doesn't that feel so good? Yeah, Just, it you know, it's, it's a great feeling, you know, for those of us who cook, when someone enjoys what you make, you know, it, it does, it kind of, it kind of warms your soul. How did you actually decide on the locations for your restaurants? Well, uh, you know, the, the first location in, in, were in Laguna Hills. Um, you know, I kind of built a friendship with the manager of the, the, uh, the center and, you know, she just said, we'd love to have a, a bakery cafe in that center. Well, I kind of grew up in the bakery business up in Northern California. My parents own uh sunrise bakeries out in Turlock, California. And, uh, uh, I'm a commercial real estate guy by trade, but we're, we're a foodie family. Um, so bakery business is second nature. We, you know, went ahead and took a stab at it and opened up our first location, Laguna Hills based on, uh, uh, you know, request from landlord, a need, the community had a need for that type of usage. So we went ahead and opened up and then the second location, we were you know, approached by a big landlord here in, in Orange County that uh, lost a bakery cafe in a location and in, in a high profile mall called Fashion Island in Newport Beach. Um, and so we backfilled that space, which was already a bakery cafe for about 20 years. Um, so we backfilled their space and, you know, remodeled the store. And well, that was serendipitous because the market already knew that it existed there. Yeah. Yeah. That probably saved you quite a bit just in terms of educating people. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, if you, if you get an opportunity to, to backfill a prior, you know, any, any type of food usage, not, not just a like, uh, product, but just any sort of food use, it just makes it a lot easier to, to open your business and, you know, it's a great tip cost effective as well. I guess we're talking about expansion. You've run into obviously challenges. What, what have been the biggest challenges just in expanding this scratch business? And, you know, how are you ensuring that, that quality? Currently our biggest issue, just like every other restaurant operation is, uh, employees, yeah. the, the labor force, um, you know, out in California, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, to, to, to get employees and keep them. Um, I don't know the mo motivation to work is since the pandemic has shifted, I'm not sure where everybody's going or what they're doing, but, uh, it's been a lot, a lot more challenging to get labor. Uh, other than that, um, opening stores for us is not, not a, not a big issue. It's, it's operating them. So operations is the biggest problem, biggest challenge. Our plans to expand over, say, you know, all over Southern California is very challenging. First of all, finding the skilled labor that that make your, for example, your your pastries from scratch. Uh, you know, it's skilled labor. Uh, so there's only so many people that that not only are are good at making the product, but that also don't mind coming in at 2 a.m. and starting their shift. That's, yeah, that's, that's the trouble, challenge, right? That, that, that's the big challenge. Correct. Is that early, that's what, second shift or third shift? Yeah, that's tough. So, in, in, and as you grow, obviously the volume of product you're selling grows and it's, you know, you're, there's only so much product somebody can make by hand. So we're in a, we're in a unique situation where we're looking at growing to multiple locations and, and we're going to end up having to invest in a central location where we can invest in equipment to help uh automate the process basically have a machine do a, 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 some of the heavy lifting when it comes to um you know whether it's laminating doughs or or shaping our our you know dry case items with our croissants muffins danish cookies things things like that um so still uh human touch is behind it but we we need some uh, machines doing some of the heavy lifting to be able to distribute enough product to really turn it into a regional size chain and still keep the integrity of the, the flavors and uh, ingredient ingredients which we won't deviate from serving food with the best ingredients possible. And you know that might help you eliminate the need for some employees if you can automate part of that process. But you're still going to be faced with how do you attract people? 
How do you train them and get them prepared for a life in hospitality and in, in cooking? A couple, I, this may be a year and a half ago, <clears throat> I interviewed uh, Greg Gorgone, and he's the CEO of Pineapple Express. And they actually have a system where they take your, like your dishwasher, literally, and you can put them through a program and add to their skills, like knife skills, uh, prep skills, and advance them along. So what you can do is show them a path. And that is one of the, the key attributes to being a great company to work for is that no matter what position they come in at, they can still grow and expand. And I would definitely encourage you know restaurant owners to consider that kind of an option. I know it's difficult, but you really get loyal people when they know, hey, I'm going to start here, but I'm eventually I'm going to be able to work my way up to literally a general manager. Sure. Uh, yeah. You know what? Make the make the connection. <laughs> <laughs> happy to happy to do it. And this and that's how we roll. I mean, I just I have met so many uh, really interesting entrepreneurs that are trying to solve the problems, you know, in this space. And I'm I'm very empathetic to those in California because not just labor shortage, but when you do have someone the uh, hourly rate is even higher than say here in the Southeast or even the Midwest. Um, well, well, let's move off the labor issue because that's, that is an issue that um, we're not going to solve right here on the podcast. So um, as you expand, as you bring in more stores and you've got two, now you're going to three, four, what is your plan to actually stay connected with your customers, you know, kind of gather that feedback, you know, and learn from them how to make your, uh, not just your operation, but your uh, front of the house even better. Well, we, you know, again, only two locations right now, but but being that we're in such such different markets between our two locations, what's unique is we've got we've got a lot of regulars, and and what's nice to see is even when I'm visiting a, a store, you can see that the customers and the staff are becoming friends. I mean, literally no intimate details about each other's lives, which is, it's, it's pretty neat. You know, I always, that is, that's great. I re, I refer it, to, you know, I don't know uh, how old everybody is listening, but, but I refer it to uh, uh, Norm walking into cheers, you know? So you, you got that type of feel with a good portion of the clientele. So where um, everybody knows your name. Exactly. So what's nice is, you know, when people know your name, they know your order, they know your, you know, your quirks um, and, and people like that. I mean, I, you know, if you like to eat something a certain way, you typically gravitate toward the same item no matter where you're going. Right. Uh, and it's nice when you walk up and they're like, hey, would you like the, you know, you like your, you know, uh, upside down sandwich, whatever the heck it is that you're ordering that day, the way you like it. And uh, people, people feel good about that. Yeah, there's a bagel shop that I go to when I'm back down in Atlanta visiting up in Alpharetta. And they know they do the same thing. They know a lot of people by by name, you know, and it kind of catches you off guard because I'm coming from a kind of a small town and I go down there and it's a pretty busy area. And, you know, she's working the front of the of the operation and she's like, hey, Tony. And I'm like, wow, you know, she's got this thing dialed in. You know, she she remembers and oftentimes people come out from the back of the kitchen and they talk about new things they're adding. Like, hey, you ought to try this. We've just added this new brisket to the menu and da 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 da. You might like that if you like this. That kind of, you know, uh, engagement is really, I think, key for the consumer. I want to get into, um, as we kind of get into the, the final portion of our, of our podcast today, really what you're envisioning for your restaurant. Um, how do you see your business evolving in the future? Maybe talk us through some of those things and maybe some of your, your long-term goals for the company and the brand. You know, our, our philosophy of scratch made food and, and beverage, um, will extend to other brands that we launch. Um, you know, I kind of foresee us being a scratch made company, not just with this particular bakery cafe, uh, business, but for example, we're roasting our own coffee uh, in house, and and so we're going to kind of uh, create a standalone business in itself that that's you know independent of scratch. Uh, so we're, we're going to do a coffee business uh, that we'll, we'll end up opening opening up stores with 
um, we've been talking about doing a uh, fast casual Mexican concept from scratch as well. You you know walk in and see your uh, tortillas being made by hand and and chips being fried and you know maybe pastor on a spit. Uh, you know we grew up in the Central Valley. Um, although I'm not of Hispanic descent, but I grew up with a lot of uh, uh, friends of mine who are Mexican and we grew up eating taco trucks, <laughs> you know? So um, we want to take a simple taco truck menu and put in a brick and mortar, uh, but serve real food down to even salsas and whatnot being made from scratch. So I foresee kind of a, a scratch, uh, scratch made empire of different concepts that will operate that one day. You know, it would be fascinating if you could have one centralized hub and then you've got your spoke model kind of built around it. Like you could have multiple concepts under one roof. You you got you you got a great idea, but we're that, that is exactly what we're planning. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, a blind pig finds a oh no, blind squirrel <laughs> finds a nut. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, it, that makes sense. I mean, it just lowers your operating cost. And listen, that model has been proven in ghost kitchens. Correct. Yeah. So you're just kind of taking on that that idea and expanding it out to your to your food empire, your soon to be food empire. Um, I guess my my final thought would be, or question for you is, you've been in this now for you're going on a decade now. So what advice? do you have for other restaurant owners who are considering expanding their business? Cause I have talked to a lot of them that have one that would love to get to two. They would love to have three, four, and you're obviously on track to have, uh, you know, half dozen this year. So what's your best advice? Uh, tricky question, but I'll, I'll kinda... <laughs> I know I waited to the end, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I here, here's the best advice I can give somebody is I think there's a, there's a kind of a, a magic number in the, in a, in a, in any sort of a retail store of any sort. I think if you're an operator, which you have a, a one location where you are physically there running it efficiently and, and making sure you've got little to no waste and you're, you know, making the best purchases you can. So you're running efficient. You can make a good living doing that. Um, Sometimes going to that second or location two or three, um, here's my biggest advice for that. You you need to be very well capitalized before you make that move. Uh, whether it's you yourself having a lot of reserves, cash reserves, or having a, an investor that uh, is behind you. And, and why I say that is because the moment you shift your focus from location one, to two, the the, lo- the first location will drop off in sales and the efficiency will not be as, as good as when you were there running it. So bottom line is, is it's going to take you a bit to dial this in, which is, which, which means you're going to be bleeding out cash. Uh, so you, I've seen a lot of people go out of business expanding too soon, not, not being capitalized, uh, well enough. So that would be my, my, you know, biggest uh, or best, best piece of advice I can offer. And and also, you know, when you're bringing on a manager, you know, I, I have found that it's best to grow your staff within and develop your own manager than, than bringing on uh, management from other concepts. Why is that? Well, they, they understand your culture. They understand your product better. Um, You know, they've, understand your staff better a lot of times I mean, if you you know for example a lot of the the larger sit-down restaurants are kind of uh, getting they're they're fizzling out so a lot of their managers are on the market and i'll just use a chain not to say that this is you know i'm just going to use a chain like for example a chili's or an applebee's or some of the big national brands you know you get one of their managers that comes to you with 20 years experience they have 20 years experience running a corporate Applebee's or a Chili's. It's very hard for them to uh, come in and, and run a concept that's from scratch. They're not used to that. They're used to taking, you know, frozen stuff and just warming it up and feeding people. They don't make anything from scratch at those concepts. So it's really difficult for them to um, figure out how to run your operation. 
Well, and that goes back to my point, you know, at the start of the podcast is that you really do have to have a way of bringing a person in, meeting them where they're at in their career and in their food journey and helping them make those next steps into next to the next role, a bigger and broader role and just kind of expanding them out. And the person that is patient and can get through that system with you truly is going to be your best manager. Yep. I agree because now they've seen every aspect of your business and they obviously like you. I mean, people do not stick around managers, owners that they don't like. Absolutely. You know what I mean? That is, that's so at the core of keeping people is you better be empathetic. You better be a great listener. You better be a great leader and a manager yourself. You can't delegate that to someone else. I mean, that's really the key to keeping your staff and that's, something I pride myself in with, with my teams, you just have to be real and authentic and, you know, people will stick, you know, they'll definitely stick around longer. I mean, we're obviously in more of a gig kind of economy. People don't stay in jobs, you know, for long periods of time, but if you can lock people in for three, five years, you've got to consider that a huge win. Oh yeah. in the food industry for sure. Oh, for sure. I mean, I'm sure it's probably even half. Oh yeah. We get half that. 22 year olds with, uh, you know, 15 employers on their resume. I've actually had to sit them down and say, Hey, look, uh, you might want to, you might want to take half those off your, (laughs) well, exactly. Well, not only that is what's the problem. Like, are you not able to see what you want in your next role? Yeah. Right. Or are you so you wouldn't say this, but you're thinking, are they so immature that when they're asked to do more, they just run from it. So it's, yeah, that's a whole nother discussion. Of course. Well, hey, Ronnie, as we wrap up, um, tell us where the two locations are, best place to find you online and any other social handles you might have. Sure. Our uh, Laguna Hills location is uh, it's in the Trader Joe's Center in Laguna Hills, California, uh, called Oak Brook Village. And our second location is inside Fashion Island Mall in uh, Newport Beach. Uh, so the, our website is, uh, www.scratchbakerycafe.com all spelled out. And, uh, you can, or, you know, same thing with Instagram which is at scratch bakery cafe. Uh, you'll find us all how about, over. How about Facebook? Uh, I believe we're the same, same on Probably the same, right? It's same scratch, Facebook. scratch bakery cafe. Yeah. Ronnie, I think we could go on for, for, for quite a while because I think there's a lot here to talk about. But I think what's I think what's next for us, I think, in this conversation is I want to see the expansion into, you know, your centralized hub and, you know, talk about how it's working, how you've, you know, you're making it operationally efficient to manage your spoke system so you can get out to those four or five, six that you want so you can start dominating, you know, more in the California market. Um, I love that I'm kind of catching you early in your process. And so the listeners can kind of come along with us on that journey. No pressure. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing that. And we'll have to have another touch base here. Yeah, would love to share the info. Yeah, that's great, Ronnie. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And thank you for fighting through the the tech issues and get back in that kitchen, man. Those those, uh, croissants don't make themselves. Yeah, no kidding. All right, Thanks. Tony. Thank you. Mike. I appreciate it, Ronnie. All Thank right. you. I yeah, it's absolutely great to 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 talk to you again here today. Right. Take care.